So welcome to New Perspectives, an integral yoga platform that is sponsored by both Aro University and Surat India, as well as the Sri Aurobindo Integral Life Centers, one in Surat and one here in Fountain in South Carolina. And I'm Rade, and uh, with me today is Dr. Vladimir Yatsenko. We are both with the Sri Aurobindo Integral Life Center in Fountain Inn. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Kiran Singh joining us, and she is with Aro University and the Sri Aurobindo Integral Life Center in Surat. So last week on New Perspectives, Dr. Ananda Reddy spoke of the links between Sri Aurobindo's record of yoga and savitri. Today, we will continue our exploration of savitri as Vladimir addresses savitri and the four boons, or the four steps towards immortality. Vladimir is a scholar and instructor of Sanskrit and Sanskrit literature and an educator in Vedic and Vedantic studies. He's aligned with numerous educational institutions uh, internationally, including several in India, Indian uh, Psychology Institute, IPI and Pondicherry, International Center for Integral Studies, ICIS in Delhi, Sri Aurobindo Center for Advanced Research, Sakar, Pondicherry, and here in the US and New Mexico, Arogya Center. So with that brief introduction, Vladimir, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Radha. Um, yes, uh, last time we had a beautiful uh, exposition by Ananda Reddy on uh, Savitri, and um, there was a question raised why Savitri was chosen as the as the major story for Sri Aurobindo's uh, magnum opus because his major uh, uh, work is uh, Savitri, a symbol and a legend and the symbol as he calls it. And um, the to answer this question we must look into the very composition of savitri and especially when it was um, presented to yudhishthira it was in the in the time when they were in exile it is uh, the story from mahabharata and uh, when they were in exile they met with um, uh, with a great Rishi uh, Markandeya, who is uh, one of those uh, eternal, uh, immortal Rishis, or, or ever 16 years old uh, Rishi, who travels from Manvantara to Manvantara. He received his boon of immortality from the first Manvantara of this Kalpa, from Shiva, from Rudra. Uh, he himself represents that particular uh, myth of immortality. And he met with Yudhishthira and five Pandavas. And when they met, uh, Yudhishthira asked him uh, to tell him about someone, anyone in the history of mankind who suffered so much as Draupadi did. Uh, and he said, yes, there was one person long ago, and it was Savitri. It's an ancient story. If it is an ancient story, even for Markandeya, we can imagine that it is the story from the beginning of Kalpa. And he tells us this story. The Markandeya Rishi, who is the devotee of the Divine Mother, who wrote his Devi Mahatmya, very famous worship and adoration of the Divine Mother in uh, his Markandeya Purana. Yeah, the same, uh, the same uh, uh, mantras which Mother uses to invoke uh, uh, the Divine Mother. Ya Devi Sarva Bhuteshu Matri Rupena Sansthita Namastasya 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 Namo Namaha. These are the verses of Markandeya from Markandeya Purana. And uh, he, this Rishi, mortal Rishi, tells the story of Savitri to Yudhishthira and Pandavas. And this is quite a significant element of it. Uh, 
And what was striking in this story, when I remember I studied this story first time in the university, I didn't know, I knew about the story, I knew that Sri Aurobindo used it for his own epic uh, story of his own evolution of consciousness, which he um, which he's using it for his own yoga and actually you know when Sri Aurobindo approached um, the mother he approached the mother asking her for permission to give him a blessing to write the story of Savitri this is also an amazing he needed a blessing of the mother to write this story so he received the blessing so he put all his knowledge into this profound uh, biggest in, in english uh, literature story and the most beautiful the most luminous definitely so why did he use this story from mahabharat and sri explains this in his um, note and I would like to project this. Uh, let me project my PowerPoint. And this is the note, author's note. Um, usually it was, it was used from his letter. The tale of Satyavan and Savitri is recited in the Mahabharata as a story of conjugal love conquering death. But this legend is shown by many features of the human tale, one of the many symbolic myths of the Vedic cycle. So it belongs to the Vedic cycle of myths of immortality, one of which is Markandeya, the other is Nachiketas, the other is Trishanku, the, the other is uh, the Manthana of uh, the ocean, uh, the churning of the ocean and Amrita. So these are the myths of immortality, one of which is Savitri and Satyavan. Satyavan is the soul, these are the symbols, Satyavan is the soul carrying the divine truth of being within itself, but descended into the grip of death and ignorance. That's why he has to live one year only. Savitri is the divine word daughter of the sun, Savitri. She is the daughter of Savitar, the lord of the sun, goddess of the supreme truth, because Savitar represents the, uh, the supermind, who comes down and is born to save. So the divine word is saving the soul. Ashwapati, the lord of the horse, her human father, is the Lord of Tapasya, the concentrated energy of spiritual endeavor that helps us to rise from the mortal to the immortal planes. Um, it is associated that Ashvapati was Sri Aurobindo himself, and we can see it in his uh, exposition in Savitri, especially in the book two, the book of the traveler of the worlds, how Ashvapati travels from plane to plane. Dhyumatsena, the lord of the shining hosts, father of Satyavan, is the divine mind here fallen blind, losing its celestial kingdom of vision, and through that loss, its kingdom of glory. Now we will have to mention these two again, the celestial kingdom and the kingdom of glory. There are two boons given to Satyavan, to the Dhyumatsena, two boons, and they, these are two kingdoms which he has to get back, his vision and his kingdom. Still, this is not a mere allegory. The characters are not personified qualities, but incarnations or emanations of living and conscious forces with whom we can enter into concrete touch and they take human bodies in order to help man and show him the way from his mortal state to a divine consciousness 
and immortal life. Now, we have to look at these four, these four major personalities of the story. Uh, more precisely, what they really represent. So in the whole story, as it starts, it starts in Mahabharata from King Ashwapati, who, who was loved by all his subjects in the kingdom, but he didn't have it progeny. He didn't have a son. And he wanted to have a progeny because how to continue his kingdom if he doesn't have a prince to continue. So he did his tapasya. That's why he's Lord of Tapasya. For 18 years, he did a severe tapasya, um, trying to uh, to get the boon from goddess Savitri notice. Savitri is the, uh, the, uh, the wife of Brahman. So he was propitiating, he was trying to get her uh, attention and to get the boon from her. So he was doing tapasya for 18 years. At the, at the end of the 18th year, Savitri appeared in front of him and told him, ask any boon. I am very happy with your 18 years tapasya. And he said, give me 100 sons. <laughs> and she said, okay, I will give you one daughter instead. <laughs> Instead of 100 sons, you will receive one daughter and you can't argue about this. Then uh, Ashwapati was quite clever. He understood that there is something there. So he didn't argue about it and he accepted the gift of one daughter. So his daughter was born, very beautiful, Kanya Eva, as if uh, the Deva Kanya Eva, as if the divine do, uh, maiden. She was beautiful and she was truthful at the same time. She was uh, not only beautiful, but truthful. And when she was 16 years old, uh, nobody tried to uh, ask her hand to marry her. And there was a reason for it, because not only she was beautiful, too beautiful for anyone to ask to marry her, but also she was, um, she was truthful, very knowledgeable. And it seems it's not very appealing to, <laughs> to princes and kings to, to have a very truthful wife. Uh, so, Ashwapati told her, so there is no match for you in this world. Please go and find your own mate. So she traveled all over the world in search of her mate through many kingdoms, through many ashrams, looking for rishis, looking for kings, and couldn't find a match for herself. And in the story of uh, uh, Sri Aurobindo, when she decided already to go back, suddenly something stopped her and she felt attracted to the edge of the forest and so and the wind was very magical and suddenly she saw from far away a small figure approaching her and the, um, and her heart was started to beat faster and faster and when that figure approached he saw she saw him and uh, it was Satyavan. And then and they spoke, he told her his name, that he is Satyavan, the son of Dhyumatsena, the king, uh, king who was uh, banished from his kingdom because he lost his sight. So they lived in the ashram in the forest. So he was a prince, but prince who had no future because he had no kingdom. And it's quite interesting, if you look at these two kings, yes, uh, Dhyumatsena and Ashwapati, so to say, Dhyumatsena has the, Dhyumatsena, the lord of the shining horse, so that uh, the divine mind, yeah, which Sherbindo says, has the sun, the soul of mankind, Satyavan, but doesn't have a future because, um, 
he lost his kingdom. And Ashwapati has the kingdom, the Lord of the power, but doesn't have a son, doesn't have a future. So here that we are, the power and knowledge, these two grand foundations of our manifestation, power and knowledge are separated, split. Power manages this manifestation, but has no future to, to make it divine. And the divine uh, presence, the divine consciousness has no power, no approach to this manifestation, separated from it. So here they have to marry. And it's quite interesting when they meet Dhyumatsena and Ashwapati in the story of Mahabharata, Dhyumatsena tells Ashwapati that many times he thought to become family with him, to marry, to, to, to bring his um, uh, son Satyavan and to marry Savitri and to become family with Ashwapati, but because they, he lost his kingdom, his sight and his kingdom, he didn't dare to do so. It's quite interesting. When he lost his celestial power, the, his consciousness, he didn't dare to come to Ashwapati until his children, their children met and decided to marry him. <laughs> Yes, and that's the whole story about their marriage. So if you look at these four major personalities, Dhyumatsena, uh, who lost his sight and his kingdom, Ashwapati, who had his kingdom but had no future, and then two representatives of these two children. So, and compare it with the story told by the mother of the four first emanations, which manifested the world. And these first four emanations were consciousness in light, bliss, truth, and life. And when they were projected for the first time, they started to move forward as if they were the supreme and they disconnected from one another and separating from one another and from the supreme source, they lost their oneness and their support and turned gradually into their opposites. Consciousness in light turned into the darkness, became blind like the King Dumatsena, uh, and bliss uh, became suffering gradually, as uh, Ashwapati was mentioned in the uh, Mahabharata, that though he was loved by everyone, he suffered a lot. Santapam Upajagmivan. He suffered being loved by all. And that suffering was his major, um, major um, fault because he didn't have the future. And uh, then truth, truth turned into the falsehood. Truth, what is truth? Truth is the and the correspondence of knowledge and power, that is truth, where the light of knowledge corresponds to power. So whatever we do is true to the consciousness, that is truth. And that truth lost that correspondence of power and consciousness. So they got separated, blind Yumatsena and uh, King Ashwapati, who had no future. And finally, life itself, the Sat, the being, was fallen into the, its opposite death. So the soul itself, Satyavan, could not sustain himself anymore in this world and had to leave it to die. And we can see in this beautiful picture drawn by Huta from the sketch of the mother. I'm using this picture as the major um, uh, concept of my presentation. You can see that these four emanations coming from the Supreme gradually turned into their opposites. And these are at the bottom, the symbols of these opposites, the darkness, the suffering, the falsehood and the death. Uh, 
Um, if you look at their um, order of their fall, it's also very interesting because the order of their fall is all, will be also the order of their recovery. So the first falls the consciousness in light. It becomes blind. When it becomes, once it becomes blind, darkness, it pulls this ananda uh, in the bliss into the suffering. That means that the power which represents the being is no more illumined by the consciousness of that being. It loses that knowledge of that infinite being. And power applied without the knowledge of the infinite being becomes suffering. It was a bliss, and now it becomes suffering. Um, and it pulls vijnana, vijnana, that proper correspondence between knowledge and power. And as Sri Aurobindo describes supermind, the, the major feature of the supermind is a total correspondence of the light of consciousness and power. Whatever is envisioned in consciousness is immediately realized in power on the level of the supermind. They got separated and the truth itself falls into total falsehood where the power does not correspond to the light of consciousness. And finally, these three, these inbuilt, intrinsic powers of the divine being of life pull life itself, which is immortal and infinite into its opposite, into death. And for the first time, the being could die. But interestingly, that all of them, they pull that one by one. They pull the whole being into its opposite, into the uh, life, into death. Uh, that's very important, the order. The order is important because that will be the order of the recovery also, of the boons which... Uh, Savitri will receive. So as you remember in the story when they met and Savitri recognized that Satyavan is her husband, she comes back to Ashwapati home to declare that she found her mate. And uh, there, there is Narad there who says that she made a mistake because Satyavan must die within uh, one year. So she should choose another mate for herself, but she says she cannot choose another one once her heart has chosen. So she moves into the ashram, into the forest, and she lives there with Satyavan and his family. Nobody knows about this, that Satyavan will die within one year. Only she knows. Neither Satyavan nor uh, his parents know about it. So, and after one year, she gathers all her foes and she goes with him into the forest to fetch the woods. And, um, and then she meets Yama. Yama comes to fetch the soul of Satyavan. And uh, in that dialogue of love and death, as Shubindu describes this dialogue in his Savitri, they dispute lie, love and death. They dispute how to proceed with Satyavan. And she wins, so to say. In Sri Aurobindo's Savitri, she fights with him. And I will speak about this later in a minute. In uh, Savitri, in the story of Mahabharata, she argues with him. She tells him about Dharma. And he's so impressed about her knowledge that he gives her boon after boon. And there are four boons. Actually, there are five boons. Actually, there are six boons, but we classify them as four boons. And I will explain why, because there are four major personalities. Um, so what are these four boons? 
The first boon she asks is the return of sight for Satyavan's father, Dhyumatsena. And it's quite interesting and it is interpreted in, uh, in Indian literature as if she is a very good daughter-in-law and uh, she knows about her father's wish to have 100 sons, Ashwapati, but she doesn't ask for the first boon from Yama to give 100 sons to Ashwapati. She asks for the first boon for Dhyumatsena's um, sight. She wants Dhyumatsena to acquire, to get back his vision because he became blinded king. Uh, he gives her this uh, uh, boon saying, ask here, every time he says, ask any boon except the life of Satyavan. She immediately says, give the sight to, to King Dhyumatsena. He says, Tathastu, let it be so, but now you have to go back. And she follows him and tells him, how can I go back if you take my husband? I, I am like a thread after the needle and so on and so forth. And she again speaks to him about Dharma. And he's again very much impressed and says, ask any, any boon except the life of Satyavan and go back. And she asks second boon, the return of the kingdom to Dhyumatsena. It's quite an impressive second boom because he lost that kingdom once he became blind. He was banished from his kingdom into the forest. So he receives the second boom, uh, Dumatsena. And uh, then she follows him again and speaks about dharma and about uh, purpose of life. And he is again very much impressed and says, ask any boon except the life of Satyavan and return. You went too far on the way to the other worlds with me when he's carrying the soul, soul, soul of Satyavan. And she says, give the hundred sons to Ashwapati. That very thing which Ashwapati did, yes. Uh, his tapasya in the beginning of the story to get these hundred sons. Now it comes, this boon, through Savitri. And he says, that has to let it be, but return, O oh child. And she still follows him. She says there is nowhere for her to go, only with Satyavan and him to another world. And speaks again, even greater wisdom on Dharma. And he is totally impressed. And he says to her, choose any boon except the life of Satyavan. And she says, give me the hundred sons with Satyavan. Now this boon is usually kind of jokingly interpreted as if she is cheated on uh, um, Yama. And Yama by mistake gave her this, this boon without the life of Satyavan. And I don't think so. I don't think this is a mistake. I think this is a proper boon, which is coming as the marriage of knowledge and power. First, she recovered knowledge and knowledge she recovered the light of knowledge in two different boons. Uh, the Dumatsena received his sight, his vision. I will come to it at the end of this presentation. And then he received his kingdom two wounds are very important. The recovery of consciousness of the, our jivatma and our psychic being, as it were. These two mm, uh, beings of consciousness had to be recovered within our existence. And then uh, she, only then she asks for hundred sons for the future of Ashwapati of power, which will be now illumined by consciousness. Only when there is a possibility of consciousness to illumine power that Ashwapati may have sons, may have future. 
and uh, that is the the next boon and finally she asks for the marriage between the power and knowledge and that is represented by the supramental manifestation or the hundred sons of Savage and Satyavan. So the supramental manifestation where the realization of oneness of knowledge and power is taking place is to take place before the immortality can be effectuated and the Satyavan's life can become immortal. And this is the whole secret conundrum of the story, why Yama granted her this boon of hundred children before he could give her the life of Satyavan. It's not a mistake. And this is what I discovered. Now, the hundred sons of Savitri and Satyavan is the supramental manifestation. It is Savitri, Savitri herself, who effectuated this. She, as the Divine Mother, brought all the psychic beings into, uh, into total correspondence with the power. And we will come at the end uh, to the... Uh, to these four... Uh, boons which she receives in Sherbindo Savitri and read about them in his Savitri and you will see for yourself. So here they are, symbolisms of four boons, return of sight of kingdom of Dumatsena, the Lord of Knowledge could be seen as a symbol of return of consciousness in light, the conversion of the forced, first fallen emanation from which all that fall started. Now the recovery starts from his recovery of from the darkness to light. Um, and not only sight, but his kingdom, which is very important. And we will see it, how Sri Aurobindo, uh, presents this in his Savitri, in this boon, when Savitri receives boon from the Lord. The hundred sons of Ashvapati was the recovery of, of the bliss, because the bliss is the correspondence of the power and the knowledge. Uh, the bliss is the Ananda Loka, which is an emanation of Sat Chit. It is built on the Chit Tapas correspondence. And in Puranas, it is called also Janarloka, the, the world, the vast world, Maharloka or Janarloka, the world of Genesis, of generation, of procreation. Everything is generated from the bliss. If you remember from the Etiriyas, Ananda Dhyeva Kalvimani Bhutani Jayanti. It is from the Ananda that all these beings are being born. Anandena Jatani Jivanti. By Ananda they all live. Anandam Prayanti Abhisam Vishanti. And to Ananda, into Ananda they go after death. Ananda is the foundation of all this world. So, the recovery of that is a total correspondence between the power and the knowledge where the being can be illumined by consciousness. The hundred sons of Savitri and Satyavan is that correspondence projected into manifestation, supramental manifestation. Might be a symbol of conversion of the falsehood into the truth truth where these two correspond, the knowledge and power. It is a symbol of supramental manifestation upon earth with all its multitude of souls. What is truth? What is supermind? A total correspondence of knowledge and power.
Here, Savitri is the Divine Mother, and all men and women, and that's what Sri Aurobindo mentions in his third boon of the supramental manifestation, where all men and women are gathered into the Mother's arms. There is no more separation on power and knowledge. These are all psychic beings, children of the Divine Mother. And finally, this effectuates the last boon, which she receives from Yama in Savitri in Mahabharata as, as the last imp impression he received from Savitri and says, receive any boon without mentioning except the life of Satyavan. And she immediately says, the life of Satyavan. I want the life of Satyavan. And it was not by mistake that he doesn't mention it because all the foundation was already prepared from the previous bones. These are four steps towards immortality. What is interesting in Sri Aurobindo's Savitri, when the Lord of Death, he is not so friendly as in, Sri, in uh, Mahabharata Savitri, he recognizes uh, that behind Savitri there is a Divine Mother and he tells her, look, let me look into your eyes that I may see her eyes within your eyes. It's quite interesting. But he doesn't want to give up and he tells her that this world is not made by knowledge, though you have knowledge, but by power. Do you have a real power? that power which will correspond to, to the light of knowledge. And, uh, and she looks into his eyes and he sees that her power is actually is expanding onto him and he's scared, the Lord of Death. And that is the, the passage from Savage. Look at this. He called tonight night, the darkness, first, first uh, uh, fall of the consciousness in light. But she fell, shuddering back. He called to hell, which is suffering, but sullenly it retired. The Lord of Death calls to everyone, uh, to all his four major emanations. Notice one by one, night, hell, he called to the inconscient, the falsehood, for support, from which he was born, his vast sustaining self. The death was born from that falsehood, from separation of knowledge and power. It drew him back towards boundless vacancy, as if by himself to swallow up himself. And then he falls to himself. He called to his own strength, death. But it refused his call. It didn't answer. The correspondence between power and knowledge was already established by Savitri. At last he knew defeat inevitable and left crumbling the shape that he had worn. He, he was wearing this shape of death, abandoning hope to make man's soul his prey and force to be mortal, the immortal spirit. This is his task, his purpose to make the mortal spirit, the mortal. Because life is nothing but perpetual change, death. And that is how in time and space the life is maintained. Now we are coming to the final part of my presentation. 
after this collapse of victory by the Divine Mother Savitri over the Lord of Death, there is the book of Everlasting Day. And I want to read the first sentence of this book because it is important, because what will follow is important after this. A marvelous sun looked down from ecstasy skies on worlds of deathless bliss, perfection's home magical unfoldings of the eternal smile, capturing his secret heartbeats of delight. The transcendental delight is being manifested on earth. God's everlasting day surrounded her, domains appeared of sempiternal light, invading all nature with the absolute's joy. Her body quivered with eternity's touch. Her soul stood close to the founts of the infinite. Now she will be receiving the four boons from the Lord, one by one boon number one. And what is interesting in this passage is that the Lord speaks first and Savitri answers to him with her request. It is as if he is offering her boon first and she is accepting it in her way. Now he says to her, Choose spirit. This is the, the voice of the Lord speaking to Savitri. Thy supreme choice not given again. For now, from my highest being, looks at thee the nameless, formless peace where all things rest. The witness consciousness the consciousness of Purusha. And silently, the woman's heart replied, Thy peace, O Lord, a boon within to keep, amid the roar and ruin of wild time, for the magnificent soul of man on earth, Thy calm, O Lord, that bears thy hands of joy. Now, if you look at this, what she requests, there will be two movements. Movement one, the peace, to keep the boon within, to keep amid the roar and ruin of wild time. Whatever happens here in Prakriti, there will be always a witness, unborn self, viewing it from above. Jivatma, realization of Jivatma. And thy calm, O Lord, that bears thy hands of joy. What are these hands of joy in that calm within? And this is something which creates this glory of kingdom, that kingdom of Dumatsena he lost, that ruling over the earth is done by the psychic being. It is only through the psychic that the Jivatma can reach out and rule on earth. And these are the hands of joy. These two major realizations convert the darkness into the Lord of Light. The Jivatma, the realization of unborn self, and involve inborn self, Antaratma, the psychic being coming forth together 
as one. Boon two. The second time the eternal cry arose. Wide open are the ineffable gates in front. My spirit leans down to break the knot of earth. Amorous of oneness without thought or sign. To cast down wall and fence. To strip heaven bare. See with the large eye of infinity, unweave the stars into silence pass. In an immense and world-destroying pause, she heard a million creatures cry to her. This is very important. Million creatures cry to her. Through the tremendous stillness of her thoughts, immeasurably the woman's nature spoke. Thy oneness, Lord, in many approaching hearts, my sweet infinity of thy numberless souls. This is what we know from Sri Aurobindo as spiritual realization of oneness. To see oneself in all beings and all beings in oneself. That's why million creatures cry to her because the whole manifestation wants to realize the oneness. So if the first was the realization, the psychic transformation, the second boon is the spiritual transformation. This is the boon of Ashwapati, that the, the inner being can be manifested in the oneness of the world. And the third boon, one, this mysterious boon of the children of Savitri and Satyavan, mightily retreating like a sea in ebb, a third time swelled the great admonishing call. I spread abroad the refuge of my wings out of its incommunicable deeps. My power looks forth of mightiest splendor. Power looks forth of mightiest splendor, stilled into its majesty of sleep, withdrawn above the dreadful whirlings of the world. The projection of this oneness of the knowledge and power is made by spreading abroad the refuge of my wings into manifestation. He gives her a hint which she should choose, what boon she has to choose. A sob of things was answered to the voice, and passionately the woman's heart replied, Thy energy, Lord, to seize on woman and man, to take all things and creatures in their grief and gather them into a mother's arms. The supramental manifestation on earth. The power enlightened by knowledge takes charge of every creature and of everything here in, on earth in this manifestation. This is the work of Savitri. And finally, the fourth born, solemn and distant, like a set of slire, a last great time the warning 
sound was heard. I opened the wide eye of solitude to uncover the voiceless rapture of my bliss, where in a pure and exquisite hush it lies, motionless in its slumber of ecstasy, resting from the sweet madness of the dance, out of whose beat the throb of hearts was born. Life itself was born the throb of hearts from which came into being. Breaking the silence with appeal and cry, a hymn of adoration tireless climbed, a music beat of winged uniting souls. Then all the woman yawningly replied, all the woman yawningly replied, thy embrace which rends the living knot of pain, thy joy, O Lord, in which all creatures breathe, thy magic flowing waters of deep love, thy sweetness give to me for earth and man. This love, that ananda from which all manifestation came into being, the very quintessence of our soul is manifested finally in the world. Now the final scheme I prepared here to show you the development in the story. So we have four major personalities four characters. We have at the beginning of the story blind Dumatsena who lost his kingdom. We have uh, uh, suffering Ashwapati. Uh, we have unasked, unmarried Savitri, a very beautiful and truthful being, and dying Satyavan who within one year must die. After one year of marriage with Satyavan, after she married Satyavan, what do we have? We have seeing Dumatsena with his kingdom returned back to him. Happy Ashwapati received his future hundred sons, married Savitri with a hundred sons as the future manifestation on earth, and living Satyavan. These are the conversions of these four fallen supreme emanations of light which turned into the darkness, bliss which turned into the suffering, truth which turned into falsehood, and life which was turned into death. So here I would like to stop and invite your questions if there are such questions or observations, insights. You, you do have uh, a question in the Q&A. Uh, now you've got two and also there was a couple that came across on the chat. So if you want to read those or I'm happy to read them out to you, your, your choice. Sure, I can see them, yes, there is. Um, uh, can we have a hard copy? Yes, you can have. Uh, actually, it was published uh, with much more details and with many more references. And I will uh, send this to those who are interested. Please uh, let me know who is interested. And so I can send this. The Bible is called the wine press, sweet wine of the <laughs> wine that we drink. Yes, it's always called the drink. The drink is the, the, the uh, in, is Savitri uh, in that tradition of the sweet drink, yes? 
I think savagery belongs to the much earlier cycle. It belongs to the to the uh, to the archetypes of our thinking. I think we all recognize that the recovery or the to reach to the immortality, we have to immortalize, first of all, our soul embodied here, so to say. We have to recover the immortal soul. Uh, then we have to, um, to enlighten uh, the power with that light of the soul. That is the second boon. Then we have to make them equal and effective. The power of life have to become effective on earth by the consciousness we embody. And then we can become immortals. This is the answer of these four stages of four steps towards immortality. And uh, well, you've got three or four um, in the in the chat. Let me just go back to the very uh, first, and we'll just kind of take them in order. Um, first one, if time permits, uh, please explain how the boons correlated to the psychic realization and spiritual re realization. You explained, but I did not understand clearly. Well, the psychic realization is the, the first boon, as it were, that the recovery of the kingdom of uh, Diomatsena. Diomatsena is the lord of the divine mind, yes, or oh, the uh, the consciousness in light, or the, the, the witness, Purusha, which has to have his kingdom. And once the witness is there, he doesn't have his kingdom yet. He needs to, um, to extend his hands of joy, as it were, <laughs> from within. That is the psychic being which is possessing this world on his behalf as his projection, because psychic being is the projection of the unborn self, of Jivatma. And these two come together as two boons in savagery, one after the other. And this is the recovery of the site of Diomatsena, and finally the recovery of his kingdom. Kingdom means that it is embodied here on earth. It's not only in heaven. It's not only from heaven viewing the earth, like, uh, like the uh, witness consciousness of Purusha. It is involved. It is reaching out, it is managing the earth in the light of that Purush. And that is the first boon. Yeah? And the recovery of the, uh, the uh, what uh, uh, Ashwapati wanted as it is connected to the, uh, to the spiritual transformation to see one self in all beings and one being in all the selves, it is something what Shirobindo had in Alipur jail, where he saw the divine present in everything and everyone. He saw it not only in those inmates in, in jail, but also he saw it in things. He saw it in, in the bars of his cell. The bars of his self were the protectors of him. He saw the tree which was giving the shade uh, against the sun as it was Narayana, Krishna, who was holding the shade over him, taking care of him. He saw the presence of the divine in every phenomenon of power and form. And this is the spiritual transformation where the, the being, the power is charged with luminosity of consciousness. I hope it answers your question to a certain extent. And I see uh, Kiran Singh, you have a, a question in the chat. Do you want to just unmute and ask uh, Vladimir? Uh, thank you, Vladimir. It, it is excellent, you know explanation but still i have a question like why savitri is called divine word and how will you justify life of satyavan what does it symbolize actually because in this mortal world to you know to again to have life is very very uh, logical mind does not you know believe in 
Yeah, she is the uh, logical mind, yes. <laughs> Our blind mind of demons and the fallen, yes, of course. It, it wants to have a light of consciousness and be illumined. I understand that very well. Um, it, we are following Sri Aurobindo's um, insight. We are following his intuition, his vision, his knowledge. Yeah? And uh, she, Savitri, with long R and long E, she is the, that, in the Indian tradition, it's also known as Gaya Tri, yes, the, the Gaya Tri or Savitri, the same way. There was, a, by the way, Savitri, the divine uh, Rishika, you know, in uh, the Rig Veda, she is the, the author of the hymn of marriage, as you know the most popular hymn in the whole Indian tradition, which is recited most, because every marriage is, uh, you have this hymn. Yeah? And that the author of this hymn is Savitri, the, the, the divine, the daughter of the sun. The daughter of the sun, because the word is the power, the intention which comes down to save. It is that knowledge, that action of knowledge, that mm, logos which creates the worlds, comes down to, uh, to break the wall of ignorance and to illumine the soul and to save the soul out of ignorance first, then out of the separation of power and knowledge second, and finally to, to make it immortal as it is in itself, but which is, which is kept in this grip of death and darkness. But that death and darkness have to be removed and it can be done by the daughter of the sun, by the logos, by the word, by that pashyantivak, by that illuminating word of Sri Aurobindo. And we are reading now Sri Aurobindo's Savitri and we are all getting illumined by this possibility of having another life, understanding this manifestation in a different way. This is what is happening through the word. Um, there is a, another question in the Q and A. Is that? Uh, I guess. Um, let me just. Check. I can also see it. Um, let me. I just see. was going to see if Karen G had. Uh, do you have any other questions, Karen G, or was that? Okay. Thank you. Yes, and Satyavan is the soul. Yeah, is the soul of mankind, of every one of us. And as long as we are in the grip of this darkness, we, we have to leave every time. We cannot stay because we, we do not have total correspondence between the action and knowledge. And they are always insufficient in a way. There is no total harmony between the higher consciousness and the lower being. So once that harmony is established, the possibility of staying is also established, that you don't have to leave. And that is the boon of immortality. Um, I don't see my many questions. Um, Hundred sounds of Savitri. If it is of truth or fact, what was their destiny? Is there any mention about them? Now, a hundred sons is 100 itself is a symbolic number. It's a Vedic number. Sri Aurobindo interprets 100 as infinity, yeah? Infinite possibilities. There is no end to the possibilities. 100 sons are not counted as 100. <laughs> yeah? And then not 101, only 100. 100 means the infinity, the higher and the lower being, or the, the transcendental and this consciousness put together into one existence. Um, I think uh, this is more a symbolic number. Uh, by the way, in Savitri, Sri Aurobindo speaks about those sun-eyed pioneers which he saw, uh, which were flaming pioneers descending from the highest heaven, rushing down on earth. This is, uh, I think that is those hundred sons of Savitri and Satyavan. 
Okay, and there's there's one more uh, question in the chat box. Um, could you explain the language of the boons in Savitri as how they relate to the four boons granted by Yama? Perhaps this session may be too short, but it would be very helpful uh, to have a line by line reading and explanation. That, that latter actually, part may not be possible, but. I actually tried to do that, <laughs> that very thing that you're asking. Most probably I failed, but um, I think you have to do it yourself. It requires really contemplation, not explanation. It needs um, kind of a discovery within yourself of that correspondence. If you can do it, you will see that every time you will discover something more and more, something new about this marvelous creation. It's very, very productive, this way of contemplating on these four boons and trying to understand how they correspond and why they are there and what do they do to us and to our living here on Earth. Good, thank you. Well, I think that is all the questions we've got. Uh, we really thank all our attendees. We see some wonderful uh, comments here, Vladimir, and feedback uh, on how much they have enjoyed your your talk and and your sharing. And and certainly from my side, it's been very, very, and not only insightful, uh, and you sharing your discoveries, but also your reading of Savitri passages were very heartfelt. Um, and really, really warm and touching. So we really, really appreciate it all. And um, in conclusion, I just wanted to mention a couple things. One, we've had uh, several requests for Vladimir uh, PowerPoint. So everyone that has registered and, and as well attended will be receiving that uh, in the next 24, 36 hours. Um, as well, you've asked whether this will be available on our website, uh, www.lagrassecenter.com. And the answer is yes, every uh, new perspective is recorded and within a day or day and a half posted. Um, so uh, please uh, look out for it if, if you'd like. And I'll also be sending the link when I send out the PowerPoint. Uh, and then lastly, we want to make uh, just a very special announcement. Um, next Saturday, May 8th, we begin a new series, which is called Discovering Sri Aurobindo. And it's in dedication to Sri Aurobindo's upcoming 150th birth anniversary next summer on August 15th, 2022. And the idea of discovering Sri Aurobindo is really to come closer to his vast heritage and, and to understand his contribution to the future development of humanity in, in all fields, uh, whether that be social sciences, philosophy, psychology, linguistics, poetry. And our very first event next uh, Saturday will uh, feature uh, the influence of Sri Aurobindo on uh, literary contribution to overhead poetry, art and drama. So we hope you will uh, all join us. We've got um, 250, 275 people registered already. If you have not registered, again, you will be receiving uh, an email that will spell out how, how to register. And we really hope that you all can join us and there's absolutely no cost uh, to next Saturday's uh, event or, or any in this uh, series that's being offered um, by the Sri Aurobindo Integral Life Centers and Aro University. So again, we, we thank you so very much, uh, Vladimir, for such a, a wonderful sharing and, and insights and all of you for joining us today and Kiranji and HP also for, for joining us. Thank you all very much. Namaste.